All right, everyone, welcome back this week. I have Kate Morton with me. She is a hormone dietitian and the founder of Funk It Wellness. Welcome to ICU, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be on here. And I think I see is just something that is not talked about enough. Like we were talking about before, my co-founder has IC and I've learned a lot about it through her. And I'm just so grateful that you have this podcast and are doing this work. Yes. So let's tell the listeners how we got connected. So I was scrolling through TikTok one day, like two weeks ago, and I see this girl on my For You page dressed up as a vulva for Halloween. And I was like, I love this. I am obsessed with this. I was kicking myself for not thinking of this for Halloween. I literally dressed up as Kita from Atlantis because I actually hosted a party and the theme was dress as your sexual awakening. So <laughs> I love that. What a it cool was party great. idea. It was so much fun. Like we had guys dressing as like Kim Possible, Haley from Paramore. Like it was so much fun. And it was the night that the Phillies had this amazing win. I'm from Philadelphia. And it was just so much fun. So Side note, go Phillies. Um. <laughs> the Phillies were also on at the Halloween party I was at, and our friend had just gotten back from watching the game in Houston because we're in Austin. And so I weirdly actually know all about that series right now since it was on at the party I was at. We love that. I'm not really a baseball fan, but I'm a Philly fan. So I'm one of those bandwagoners that will just go ham cheering them on. I mean, especially the Eagles. They are killing it right now. Um, but okay, back, back to, I see hormones. So I found out that you were a a registered dietitian and I was like, okay, I I'm sliding into this girl's DMS and asking her to be on my podcast because I just love people who are fun to come on here and, and talk about, you know, science-based things and, you know, all the things. So Welcome. Can you give the the audience a little background on you and, you know, what things led you to becoming a hormone dietitian? Yeah. So honestly, I never thought that I was going to become a hormone dietitian. It wasn't like my dream from childhood. I was actually a pediatric pulmonary dietitian first, meaning I worked with um, children ages zero to 22 who had cystic fibrosis. And so that was my first job. And I thought I wanted to work in pediatrics for forever. And then I got an opportunity to move to New Zealand with my partner. And I had just finished up grad school. I had just finished up my like contract at the hospital. had expi- It was about to expire. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to put this on pause. I'm going to go experience life in my early 20s. So that's what I did. And I simultaneously decided to come off birth control when we moved over there because I had like every symptom in the book from being on birth control from, and I got on it at age 13 because my mom had a child really early. And so like, I get it. Her fear was like, we want to make sure that, you know, you're on birth control and you're not going to get pregnant and all these things. And so it was interesting because I had been having bad side effects the entire time. But when I got the next plan on in my arm, which I don't know if anyone else is familiar with that, it's a little rod implant that goes into your arm and it's progesterone based. So the synthetic form of progesterone, I bled every day for two years. Like oh, it wow. was like, and not quite a period, but definitely like spotting. And so like, it just was so, for me, it felt embarrassing. It's before I dealt with a lot of like my period shame. Well, how, and then- how old were you? At that point, I was, I was on that birth control for five years total. And that was ages like 18 to what is that? Like 23. Wow. And so, yeah, like right when you're kind of like getting to know your body and like talk about like a sex life killer and confidence killer and like shame around sexuality, like so much of that came from that experience. Um, I also had a really complicated relationship with food that really flared up on the specific birth control. And so needless to say, it was not good for me. And I know that birth control works for some people. Just for me, it was not good. And I got off of it in New Zealand and I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to be this holistic goddess. I am going to just like fall in line with my body and it's just going to be perfect. That is not what happened. I got horrendous cystic acne, like from ear to ear, just like painful. Like they would grow on top of each other. They would hurt so bad. I didn't even want to smile. My hair started falling out. 
my period did not come back for six months. So I was freaking out about that. So I didn't ovulate for like six months after coming off. And then when it did come back, it was horrible. And I learned so much that experience because I was going to all these doctors. I was trying to figure out what was going on. I was about to go on Accutane for my acne. And then my doctor, it's interesting how the medical system works over there. So you go to like a primary care doctor, but they have specialties. So like my doctor specialized in hormones and skin. And so he said to me like, okay, can I have you try two things before you, you know, go on Accutane? So he's like, I want you to cut out dairy completely because I did an intolerance test and it like was the top thing on my intolerance test. Um, And then he said, I want you to also try something called called seed cycling. And another friend had introduced me to that, which was really interesting. So I was like, okay, both these things sound crazy. As a dietitian, I just like thought that it was such BS. I was like, there's no peer reviewed evidence on this. It's not the case. Well, after three months, my cycle was starting to regulate. My acne was not gone, but healing. And everything else was falling into alignment. And that was my first, a long-winded way to say my first way of getting introduced to how food impacts our hormones. And the more I learned and the better I felt and the more I came in line with myself, I just couldn't stop talking about it. Like I felt like everyone I talked to, like I had to tell them. And then like so many of my friends were like, oh my God, I had no idea that this impacted this or that what I ate impacted my menstrual cycle or that there's four phases to the cycle. Like we all just thought like our menstrual cycle was our period and we were just like a boy every other day. So right. no, they it, don't teach us no. about the different parts of our cycle when we're going through like sex ed in middle school or wherever we had it. Well, even like the other thing was like, there's so much peer reviewed evidence on how our diet needs to change with our menstrual cycles. And I don't know about you, but that was never taught to me in my undergraduate or graduate degree. It was never taught to me in my life. <laughs> no. <laughs> and like, I just like pieced it all together through the internet. And then I was just like experimenting on myself. And then I ended up moving back to Austin and I are, I live in Austin, Texas. And I was making these seed cycling kits at my house. And like my friends were wanting, so I was like giving them to my friends and like all this stuff. And then it just like kind of luckily spiraled into becoming a business and being able to be my full-time job, getting to dress up on the internet like a vulva and run around. And my biggest thing is just destigmatizing stigmatized issues specifically for people with uteruses because it's ridiculous. We love that. That's what we're also doing here. So I, you are an absolute queen for doing this. And I want to dive into the birth control topic. I mean, I know there's various forms of birth control out there. I mean, there's the pill, there's the thing you said, What what is that called? The next plan on it's like called an implant. So different okay. than an IUD. Got it. And then the IUD, is there anything else? I mean, there's also like spermicide creams and like other like topical things you can use. There's like a female condom, there's mm-hmm. regular condoms, but like hormonal birth control wise, you could pretty much covered it. Okay. Got it. And I mean, I have been on birth control since I was 16 and it's because I begged my mom to be on it. I had, Oh, I most- thought it was so cool. Like right, I thought exactly. it was cool to be on birth control. I would like set my alarm and like pull out my little yes. blue packet and be like, oh, I'm just going to take my birth Exactly. Control which is so bizarre. And I mean, yeah, I had really painful periods and I, I really wanted to stop that, but I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. There was this really fun, exciting element to it. Like as you're kind of going into being sexually active, you know, high school, college age. And I, oh my gosh, I remember on my way home from that appointment, we were in the car, she was driving me home and she was like, okay, this doesn't mean that you get to have sex with everyone that you want. And I was like, mom, I'm not going to do that. And like, I was mortified that we were even having that conversation, but that's, that's a fun little side note memory that lives in my brain. Um, and I have been on the same birth control ever since, and I'm 27 now. So I've been on it for 11 years and I've always wondered what it would be like to go off of it because I've been seeing on social media, so many women who are having or, or or just their their health improves after they go off of it. I mean, and I'm definitely I want to talk about that with you. You know, what could be those benefits of getting off of that hormonal birth control? I mean, for me, 
it was night and day. And, you know, like, I'm going to be honest, like, talk about research. Like, there is a lot of mixed BS on the internet. Like, when you go to look into birth control and, like, not to be conspiracy theorists, but in my opinion, I do think the confusion is intentional. I think that it's a billion dollar industry. And like, that's the first thing to keep like top of mind. Like also I'm pretty sure birth control was one of the very first pharmaceutical drugs to advertise with commercials, which also really plays into that. Like we thought it was so cool. We thought that this was like our strong independent woman phase. And so that's like a side note, but for me, it was night and day. And I do want to preface that with saying I'm actually not anti-birth control by any means. I think it serves a really great purpose of preventing birth. And I actually wouldn't change being on it in my early teen years because I wasn't responsible. I didn't have the education. Like Mm -hmm. it was a good thing. But I think people are smart enough to get the education and to hear all the side effects and to hear how it works and then be able to make their own choice. So how birth control actually works is it shuts down your menstrual cycle. So that means it disrupts the communication from your brain to your ovaries. And so you're not actually cycling and that period you're having isn't a real period. And so that does help. So like when people say, I want it for acne or painful periods or any of these things, the reason it works is because your hormones are actually not functioning. You're taking synthetic hormones to kind of like shut them up essentially. Um, So if you're on hormonal birth control for any of those reasons, that's totally valid. And if it works for you, I encourage you to do what works for you. But if you're like, I don't know, maybe I would like to get off of this and see what my body does. I'd recommend working with someone who can help you get to the root cause of those things. So, you know, like painful, extreme pain around your period, heavy bleeding, cramping, acne, extreme mood swings. That was a big one for me. Like, mood swings and mental health were just so disrupted for half of the month um, when I was kind of working on my hormones. So all of those things are not medically normal. They might be common in the society we live in and they might be joked about in, you know, movies and TVs and all these things, but it's not actually normal and you can talk to your doctor about it. Um, So that's like a little side tangent. But when something that people don't always realize is when it's disconnecting, you know, your communication through the brain and the ovaries, basically like scrambling it with these fake hormones, you can potentially also get depleted of vitamins and minerals that are really important for you. So at the bare minimum, if you're listening, it's like, okay, B vitamins, vitamin C, magnesium, and zinc can all be depleted from the birth control pill. And the research is inconclusive on that, but it actually is listed in a lot of the birth control packets. So if you're on it, even just like prepping to come off of it, I would encourage you or to like look into those vitamins. You can get them through food sources or like really high quality supplemental sources. Mm -hmm. So that's one, but the biggest, so here are like the biggest complaints. One, mental health on birth control. A lot of people have reported mental health um, struggles on birth control. And when you, there's a documentary called The Business of Birth Control And when they were initially doing a lot of the research, mental health was not taken into consideration and it wasn't considered a valid side effect. So it wasn't studied a lot in the early days of birth control. Um, Two, libido. So a lot of people say that they went on birth control and the whole reason it works is because now they never want to have sex again. And so libido can be disrupted. Um, like we talked about, those vitamin and mineral deficiencies can be disrupted. And a lot of people report um, gut health disruption. So changes in their gut health. So that can be things that come with it. If you come off of it, it can be a process. Because like for me, I was also on it for about 10 years. And so like your body kind of goes through this. They don't, there's a term called post-birth control syndrome. It's not validated by um, conventional medical doctors, but a lot of people report similar things that I did with like hair loss, acne, period, not coming back. That can just be the hormones like working their way out of your system. So when you're coming off birth control, it's really important to support your liver because your liver metabolizes a lot of chemicals and it also metabolizes a lot of our hormones like estrogen. So supporting our liver, um, making sure we're looking at vitamins and minerals and kind of, okay, Are we getting the right amounts? If you have access to getting vitamin mineral testing, I think that's a great place to start. Like if you have any deficiencies and where to plug in. 
And then two, other ways you can support your liver, sweating, drinking water, eating enough fiber, um, focusing on probiotic rich foods, and then also learning to track your menstrual cycle, because this is going to be a huge indicator now that your hormones are going again. I was like mm-hmm. a little bit of a rant. I could talk about this all day long. Oh no, no, you're fine. This is teaching me so many things. Um, first, first thought in my mind is the only reason I've ever read the birth control packet thingy that they give you with it is because I most likely missed a dose and I had no idea what to do the next day. So I feel like if there's a takeaway here, you should go read that <laughs> to yeah. be informed. And like some people, you know, they get put on birth control for migraines, but then some birth controls are contraindicated for migraines. Or like if you have a history of hormonal related cancers in your family, like um, of heart disease risks, there's other things that we need to think about Um, because birth control, while it's an amazing tool for preventing birth, it's also a drug. So we need to think about it like a drug. We need to think about it um, you know, pros and cons, side effects. We need informed education around it. Like there's just so many things. I feel like it's kind of just handed out without, like I never got any education. I was just like, take this pill, do this thing. And then Mm -hmm. even when I told them, like my implant got lost in my arm and I called them and they were like, no, it didn't. They're like trying to like gaslight me about it. Oh boy. I'm like, bro, it's not there anymore. And then sure enough, it was in my bicep. So like, just like (laughs) knowing that there's other risks outside of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it comes down to that education piece that the IC community knows all too well that we, we really have a big gap there. Um, I mean, I, I know that I've talked with my doctor before about, you know, is this birth control, like me being on it for so long, is that gonna cause problems you know, if I stay on it in terms of fertility or anything like that, if I ever want to have a child, um, I've also, and, and they said no every time. And so I, I never know whether to, you know, believe them because obviously I trust my doctors, but I feel like there's so much research out there that I would love to just have a longer conversation about it. And I don't know if you know of any, any research out there about that. So there is a little bit, so it's kind of twofold. And this is the tricky thing about researching this subject is if you went on birth control for one of the reasons we talked about before, painful periods, irregular cycles, inovulatory cycles, any of these things, birth control didn't fix or cure those things. It cover it's a band-aid. It's a band-aid. So when, you, when you come off of it, you're still going to have the same issues um, that you had before. So that's why root cause analysis is super important when it comes to coming off birth control. Um, it's interesting. So there's not a ton of research on it again, but there is, so like you would think, okay, you're going on birth control. You're not ovulating. You would think that you would go into menopause later, but the, there is, and this relates back a little bit. There's research that you go, will go into menopause at the exact same time, whether you took birth control or not. Meaning like you're still losing eggs. You're still like that process is still somehow happening each month. Um, But the research is inconclusive of if it affects fertility. I can say my personal experience of like fertility clients I've worked with. It takes about, I know they say it can happen like the first cycle after getting pregnant. But in my clinical experience, it's usually about a year. Mm -hmm. um, after coming off birth control and really working on hormones. Um, and they also say it can take up to a year to like replenish a lot of those nutrient stores too. So it's not impossible. It just takes more time. So like, it takes a little bit more planning, um, to be able to fully regain your cycle and fertility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to connect this back to IC because there's so many people that, you know, either I worked with or I just hear about in the the support groups out there, but people are flaring. Their IC is flaring on a monthly basis, which leads us to believe that it is hormonal at its root cause, I guess we'll say. And the really tricky thing is that once you identify that it is a hormone issue, you know, there isn't any, or there's minimal research out there you know, with what steps to take after that. And 
it, it's really confusing for a lot of people. We, it's like, okay, we've identified that hormones are the issue. You, you take that to your doctor and they put you on what, like an estrogen cream or some hormone replacement therapy. I'm not really educated on those things, but it's, I feel like it's so much just trial and error. Doctors kind of being like, okay, try this, come back in six months. Let me know how it goes. And it's just like, there's, there's not a solution and it's so frustrating. Yeah. And it was really interesting when I was like prepping for the podcast and like listening and like doing research, it was interesting to me how, you know, people with uteruses and women are more likely to have IC and than men are. And so that was interesting to me. And then the connection in estrogen and mast cells, which I know you talk about in a past podcast, um, that's really interesting. So I was digging into the research around that. And it's like all things I think related to a lot of women's health topics. It's like, okay, if you're estrogen dominant or have too much estrogen, this could affect your IC. But also if you have low estrogen, this could affect your IC. And so it is interesting that there seems to be an estrogen and mast cell connection, but it's all the research just isn't there yet to say exactly what it is. Um, there are also two research studies, which I'm going to dig deeper and like try to find the exact links to them that did talk about the potential connection in IC and long-term birth control use. So amazing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. If you find those, let me know and I can link them in the show notes for this, but I, I think it just goes to show we have so much work to do still with the research and, you know, finding that connection and maybe digging deeper into potential subtypes out there and hormones being one of them. And, you know, and it, it seemed like when I was doing the research and again, like I'm not an IC dietitian, but like, I'm really passionate about destigmatizing subjects and subjects people aren't doing research on, but like it seems that the imbalance of estrogen is the connection. So like whether it's high or low, it's the imbalance. And unfortunately, we live in a world that is so estrogen imbalance heavy because of stress, lack of sleep, not getting enough fiber, um, synthetic xenoestrogens, which is another thing that came up. I don't know. Have you talked about that on the podcast before? No, I've never even heard of that word. <laughs> okay, so... I'm like such a hormone nerd. And so synthetic xenoestrogens are chemicals that are in a lot of products. They can be in like beauty products. They can be in dyes and food. They can be in um, makeup. They can be in soap. It's like a synthetic chemical and it's an estrogen mimicking chemical. And when we use or ingest um, pesticides, that's another one it's in. Um, that can cause excess estrogen, which is listed as like one of the most common causes in the U S wow. That is insane. Yeah. That was one of my biggest surprises. Like when I was reading this and actually the IC website, like I was doing a bunch of research on there cause they're really good at like linking their, um, actual research on there. And I was like, I can't believe I didn't think about xenoestrogens being such a, cause it's also like, um, people who have PCOS, have higher estrogen and it looks like that that could potentially put them at an increased risk for IC but xenoestrogens is one of the first things they'll have you like try to cut out so like laundry detergent is like also a really common one mm -hmm. okay like tide or like you know like the super yummy smelling like good smelling laundry detergent yeah I always tell people you know go scent free do do your best to remove all of those fragrances from your life and see if it makes a difference. I mean, for me, it was night and day. Those are so irritating to me. So that could be why. And I know like on your other podcast, I like listened to like your whole podcast. I love that you did your research coming on here. Like I'm so impressed by you. <laughs> but I know you were saying like you have sensitive skin and like I also have really sensitive skin and I had estrogen dominance. That was my hormonal imbalance that I struggled with. And like it's interesting when I cut out all the fragrance, and this is just like a tangent at this point, like when I cut out all the fragrances and all the stuff that honestly I loved, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I love smelling good and I love all these things, but like it is night and day. Like I have rosacea and eczema and it's like gone now. That's so awesome. How would someone get tested for uh, imbalances? Yeah. So it's interesting when you go into your doctor, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. So there's like home testing kits. They're not going to be like as accurate, but 
you want to get tested at different times in your cycle. So like let's I'll go over the menstrual cycle really quick and this will give you guys like a window into why you have to be specific about when you're testing. Okay. So the first day of your period is actually the first day of your cycle. And your period is when your hormones are going to be their lowest. Then when you stop bleeding, you go into your follicular phase and that's when estrogen's rising. Then you LH spikes and you ovulate. And then I like to think of it as like handing off a baton in a relay race. In a seamless cycle, then you're handing the baton off to progesterone, which will produce in the second half of your cycle from the corpus luteum, which is formed from ovulation. So get this, you ovulate, you release the egg. It produces like, it's not called a mini organ. I just can't think of a better way to say it. Mini organ is not scientifically mm-hmm. correct. It produces this little like sac and it produces your progesterone for the whole second half of your cycle. So like every month when you ovulate, it happens that way. And then after that, if your egg's not fertilized, that's when all your hormones will start to dip. And then that triggers your uterine lining to shed. So that's kind of how it works. So if we're looking at getting tested for high estrogen, you're going to want to talk through with your doctor about where you are in your cycle and they'll be able to recommend when they think you should get tested, but you shouldn't be testing hormones on your period while you're bleeding. Your results will come back and probably tell you that you're in menopause. Like Mm -hmm. I had someone that happened to one of my friends was like, I got my hormones tested on my period and now they told me I'm in early menopause. And I was like, I think you need to go back on like day. Like, I think it's like seven of her cycle. She went back and they're like, oh yeah, everything looks good. So Mm -hmm. there's some different things you can do, but I always recommend talking to your doctor about it because they're going to know your cycle best of like what they want to test for. Um, But you can also kind of go if you're like, I don't want to go to the doctor. I don't like playing a guessing game, but you can. Like estrogen dominance is usually heavy periods, heavy, painful periods because estrogen is causing that uterine lining to just grow thicker and thicker and thicker. And then low estrogen is usually going to be like light periods with like or um, like almost like pink blood. And so those are kind of like two of the difference. Also, um, excess estrogen is like really painful breasts around your um, cycle, really painful cramping. And then uterine fibroids can also be another sign of excess estrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay. What doctor would people talk about this with? Would it be a gynecologist? (sighs) Here's the tricky part. So could, if you have a great gynecologist who you feel like really listens to you, yes. Um, Additionally, you can find someone that does something called Dutch testing. Um, It's kind of the most comprehensive hormone panel and it's a urine-based test. You, um, a lot of dietitians can actually um, test and read Dutch um, panels, naturopathic doctors. um, And if you have like a functional gynecologist, they should be able to do that too. But I definitely would recommend like starting with your gynecologist, um, Maybe if you've got a really great primary care doctor, in my experience, I've done this testing actually with other dietitians. Okay. Got it. I wish I did it. I don't do Dutch testing. It's like a whole other like really cool certification, but um, you can find some really great dietitians and naturopathic doctors that do it. Right. And I'm glad that we're talking about the Dutch test because I I don't know where I saw this, but I, I just... Some somewhere along the line, I saw dietitians talking about the Dutch test in a negative way, like there wasn't enough evidence supporting it. Have you ever seen anything like that? Or am I making this up? I mean, that doesn't surprise me that that would be a conversation. Um, In my experience, it's been really insightful. It is Mm -hmm. a little bit expensive. That's the one thing I will say, like insurance doesn't really like always cover it. You can submit it back to your insurance. But in my experience, it's been really, really insightful for people. Um, but it also is a newer test, so I could see that too. I feel like maybe I saw – do you know Abby Langer? She's a Canadian dietitian. No, I need to look She writes that. these really um, – <laughs> they can be kind of vulgar. She's one of those people that, like, just writes her feelings and she reviews certain things, like maybe diets or tests like this and – I feel like she wrote something about it. Maybe I can find it later and send it to you and see what you think. But I think that might be where what I'm thinking of. And, and you know, we'll figure that out. But what are, yeah. are there any other tests that people could do besides that one? To do Dutch testing, you can ask, like the estrogen test, I'm pretty sure is a blood test. Um, Like when I had mine tested. So 
estradiol test. Um, also, another great way is to track ovulation. So this isn't a test, but like if you track your ovulation and your cervical mucus, your temperature spiking, um, and you can also like test for progesterone like later in your cycle and confirm quality of ovulation, you can do all that at home through urine. And that's actually, there's a company called Prove that does it. And that's really insightful because you'll be able to see like, okay, am one, am I ovulating? Because that's a huge thing of like hormones being in balance. Am I ovulating? And then two, what's the quality of my ovulation? Mm -hmm. So those two things can be very insightful. To be honest, there needs to be a lot more research in hormone testing. I don't think that it's fully like flushed out as much as it could be, but I use Prove at home and that was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you were explaining the, the phases of the menstrual cycle to me, I'm just like that, that meme of that girl just like staring into space and there's like a math equation around her head. That is me. And I don't know why it is so hard for me to just understand all of this. So if anyone's listening and you are just not following along, you know, you're not alone. This is a difficult subject. Like this took me years. Like I have been doing this full time for like years at this point. And like, look, I'm not an expert on testing hormones. Like that's still not something that I'm a total expert in. Um, But I remember when people were telling me about the menstrual cycle, it just took me so long to compute it in my brain. And I will tell you, it did not start making sense to me until I started tracking and like religiously noting down how I was feeling. Um, And I'm not a per- person who journals. I really want to be like, I want that to oh, be a part of my identity, but same. it's not. It's at um, my core. I'm not a journaler. I'm not either. And like, I want to be, but like I committed to myself for three months. I was going to like use my period tracking app. I was going to note it down. I even like pulled my partner in on it. Cause I was, cause we use the fertility awareness method to not get pregnant. Like we're actively trying not to conceive. And so I was like, you need to know about this too, because like it's for both of us. And then it's so crazy after years of doing it with trial and error, I do feel so in tune with my body. Like I know where my energy is. I know where my brain is. I've got ADHD and I try and I manage it like through diet and exercise and therapy. And, but when I'm ovulating that like 24 hour period, my brain feels scrambled. And like, I've been learning about that, that like our hormones actually can like disrupt our GABA and serotonin and they can make it difficult to concentrate. So there's even so much I still don't know. So if you're listening and feeling overwhelmed, I'm sorry. And I promise like it, the best way to do it is just to start getting familiar with your own body. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So when someone does this test, they get their results. Like, what do you do with that information? Like, what do doctors do with it? So that's why it's really important to work with a practitioner that is well-versed in these testing mechanisms and can look at it and understand. And so like for me, when I did all of the testing and I found out I was estrogen dominant, I was like, okay, so what do I do? And honestly, for me, the first thing was I had to work on my stress. I'm like very type A. I don't know if you know Enneagram. I'm an Enneagram three, which is like the achiever where we're like obsessed with perfection and workaholics. And Mm -hmm. I was like over exercising. I was under eating, under sleeping and overworking. So like those were the first things I had to start with. So for me, stress. Um, And actually for low estrogen and high estrogen, stress is a big cause of both. Um, When our bodies are stressed, it's actually meant to protect us. And I know you also talk about that, but it also is saying to our bodies, like it's not safe to ovulate this month because you have too much going on and this is our body. We can't handle anything else. Um, So I had to work on that. Something interesting that somebody told me was every night before bed, because I'm not a journaler and I'm not a meditator, something I would do was like put my feet on the wall and like invert my feet. It like forces your body to like reset. So I worked on stress. I got an aura ring and started working on sleep. And then after I had gotten those two foundational pieces under control, that's when I started syncing my nutrition with my cycle. And that was also a game changer. I also unfortunately had to cut way back on booze, like to the point where I don't really drink anymore, which honestly, I'm not going to lie. was so hard. Like Mm -hmm. I love a good night out and like, but it just, it wasn't loving me back. And so 
that's what I worked on personally. And then that's kind of when you're working with someone, what they'll help you decide, like, you know, your inflammation is really high. Your cortisol is high, like all these things. And they can help you like work backwards from there because everyone's mm-hmm. so different. Like it's hard to give blanket advice. Cause like all of our causes, our triggers, our lives are just so different. So definitely work with someone if you can, who can really specialize and personalize it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're preaching to the choir when it comes to like individualizing things. There's no one size fits all solution. Um, I had a thought and it escaped me. (laughs) Um, of course, can you get into, you know, what the nutrition stuff (laughs) looks like for, for somebody dealing with hormone imbalances and all of that. And maybe if I think of my thought, I'll let you know. Yeah. Just interrupt. Just go right right in. Okay. So when we're thinking about our cycles, I like to start with the foundation and I'll be super transparent with you guys. Like I come from a very complicated relationship with food and I have spent years working on that. So the traditional like cycle syncing is difficult for me because I don't like to put food in boxes. So what I'm going to share with you guys is just some general guidelines and some ideas of how you could do this. And I always think the key is adding things in. Don't worry about taking them away yet. Let's focus on what we can add. Um, So when you're on your period, your body is going to be generally a little bit more inflamed, which also if you have IC and you're listening to this, I know inflammation is a key, key part. So if you do notice flares around your menstrual cycle, there is an extra level of inflammation that's going on. And I'll be honest with you guys, I've read so many research articles about it. They don't know exactly why it happens, but we do know it happens. Um, So I like to focus on anti-inflammatory foods. So this could be like, I like to make, I call it like turmeric lemonade. It's like lemon water with turmeric, a little bit of black pepper, a little bit of maple syrup. And I'll have that like every morning. You can That also sounds add- like an icy nightmare. Oh no, <laughs> is it? Okay, tell me. Oh, you can't I, have I, lemon. Lemon? You can't have vitamin C. Turmeric is a try it item. I honestly think it's fine. Um, black pepper is also a try it item. So I That's mean, so what about ginger? Ginger is typically fine. Okay. So then ignore that lemonade. Do not make that. <laughs> I just remembered about the vitamin C. As soon as I said it, I was like, you're fine. Oh. If you don't live with IC or like directly live with somebody with it, like it, we don't expect you to so remember. What about peppermint or ginger? Peppermint and ginger are, are typically fine. So those could be two really great things around period time for, I guess if like, if you have IC, cause if they're good and they're not a trigger for you. Those are really soothing and can help with inflammation, but we're also going to want to focus on gut health around this time, which we're going to want to do throughout the entire cycle. Okay. So we need to make like a cycle syncing addition for people with IC because I feel like a lot of the foods may actually make it worse. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're going to, that's going to be a separate project that we're going to work on. (laughs) Um, Yeah. That's so, okay. That's so interesting. Um, I love getting to like learn and anyways, that's so interesting. So inflammation is going to be more on your period. So, and I also know you mentioned in past episodes, like if you kind of know something like this is coming, really being careful on things you do know triggers you. So period and ovulation seem to be the two places in the cycle that, um, research has somewhat been able to identify that there's a little bit more inflammation. So also thinking about warm foods. So in terms of digestion, your body has a lot going on. So like cooked veggies and cooked foods, like when we say warm, it means like cooked foods to give your digestion a little bit of a break. Um, We also love focusing on omega-3s. So this is like kind of where seed cycling can come in because it makes it a little bit easier. We'll talk about that in a minute. But omega-3s can be in like fatty fish. They can be in um, black seeds, chia seeds, walnuts. So omega-3s, gut support, and anti-inflammatory foods that you can tolerate. Key. And a little bit of background on inflammatory foods if you're listening. Everyone's think triggers are different. Foods that inflame me will not inflame you, will not inflame the next person. So like for me, dairy is really inflammatory. For some people, it's not. For me, I'm allergic to shellfish. I can't have them. Other people, it's a great source of iodine. So Make sure you kind of know what works with your body. 
Then as you move into the follicular phase, this is like your new spring. So you're going to want, and you actually have higher insulin sensitivity in your follicular phase, meaning foods like, what about like sweet potatoes? I'm just going to like check every food yeah, with you now. Like fine. Online. Sweet potatoes are fine. So like complex carbs, like sweet potatoes are amazing in this phase. So you're going to really focus on nutrient density, your diet, uh, your not diet, not your dietitian, your digestive system is picking up here. So if you want to like have more fresh fruits and veggies or more of these uncooked foods, like I really crave a lot of like salads, avocado toast, like all of these yummy foods in that phase, that's going to be really important. Um, magnesium and zinc and antioxidants are going to be great because zinc can help with egg quality and egg quality is going to be important for ovulation. Um, so we're going to focus on omega-3s, magnesium, zinc, and lots of fiber in this phase. Then after we ovulate, we're going into our luteal phase where insulin sensitivity decreases. So this means that your body can't process, um, sugar as well, but sugar means, you know, carbohydrates, all these other things. It's not like just sugar. So that means we're going to want to increase protein. So in the second half of your cycle, after you ovulate, you want to increase your protein. Um, for me, I eat plant-based in the first half of my cycle, and I actually eat animal protein and dairy in the second half of my cycle. Um, so increase protein, again, focusing on anti-inflammatory foods, but then we're also going to want to focus on vitamin E and vitamin B6 from our food. Those two things together are two of the most studied nutrients when it comes to relieving PMS symptoms. So vitamin E, vitamin B6 from foods, um, and then it starts all over again. B6 is actually when supplemented an IC trigger, but I always recommend getting your vitamin B6 from food. So that's fine. And I would, I would like, love to build off that. There's a lot of evidence that B6 supplementation from artificial sources actually isn't even properly absorbed in the body. It's something that you genuinely need to get through food. B vitamins specifically, um, I can send you the research link on it. It's really interesting that supplementation of B vitamins actually increased the incidence of PMS, but when B vitamins were consumed through food, they decreased it by 35%. So it's interesting processing vitamins and minerals and extracting them. That's, that could probably be a whole other podcast. So <laughs> I'm totally on board with like all of these things I'm talking about. I really, really mean from a food-based approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Possible. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Okay. So how does seed cycling come into all of this? I mean, I told you we, we did an episode on this back in season one, but it has been a long time, maybe a year since I recorded that. So if you could refresh my and the audience memories. If you're still with us and you're still hanging <laughs> on for dear here. life with all the information <laughs> I've thrown at you, um, if you can't tell, I'm really passionate about what I do and I get very into it. If you, um, I mean, you guys can't see her, but she talks with her hands a lot. Yeah. Oh, I know. If you could see me, I could pull out my whole cycle chart. I also have my uterus right plus you right here. I love that. I want to get a bladder one. You should do it. Okay. So seed cycling. Seed cycling takes all the complicated things I just told you and makes it very simple. So it breaks your cycle into two. We're going to focus on supporting estrogen balance and progesterone balance. From the first day of your period to when you ovulate, one tablespoon of organic flax, one tablespoon of organic um, pumpkin seeds. After you ovulate to your next period, one tablespoon of sunflower seeds, one tablespoon of sesame seeds, all of them organic, all of them ground. They contain so many of those nutrients we were just talking about, and they make it really simple. Um, you kind of, I look at them as a nutrient-based topper. You can just add on top of the food you're already eating. So you can, I had it in a smoothie today with like collagen and it was like a pre-made smoothie. And then you can put it on oatmeal, toast, anything you're already eating. You just add your seeds on top. With Funk It, I got really fed up with the grocery stores I was buying. I would open the bag and I could smell the seeds were already rancid, even if they had like, and they were kind of like clear containers when they should be an opaque. So we take a lot of that off. We actually source from the US or Europe. We do everything in the United States. Everything gets to you within four to six weeks of being ground, which is like the key metric. And on top of that, um, you don't have to worry about like excess pesticides and all these other things you may have to with a grocery store seed. But if you're like, I just want to seed cycle on my own, you totally can. And you can just go to the store and get those seeds and just get started. It takes about three months to work. 
but it was my first introduction into syncing my food with my cycle. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to do a, a quick side note. So when it comes to seeds and the IC diet, um, I, I just pulled up my IC, what do we call this? Yeah. Diet? Where do the seeds fall? I see end food list. Um, I, I think this app is like three bucks on the app store, but so it says sunflower, pumpkin, and sesame seeds are try it items. So my thought process is if you are someone interested in seed cycling, you could test the seeds one at a time. Um, you could start with a very small amount and do a three-day test period where you are seeing how your body responds to these seeds and make sure that it doesn't affect your bladder in a negative way. And then you can go from there and then, you know, take a couple of days off between um, items. And then you can just test all of those things that Kate just said. And you can kind of do it like a mini elimination diet with a reintroduction phase. Yeah. It's like, so oh, that's so cool. There's an app. I need to send that to, I wonder if Claire has it. I need to send it to her. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I know it's really difficult with IC because everyone's triggers are so different. And like, honestly, that's why we could get into foods all day long on cycle syncing, but I do think it's going to really matter like what, what your triggers are. But what I would tell anyone who's listening, who's like, this sounds interesting. I'm a little nervous. Cause I've kind of like got my foods that I know work. Focus, the first focus is blood sugar balance. So the first note is like for that first half of your cycle, knowing you have higher insulin sensitivity most likely. And for the second half, knowing you have decreased insulin sensitivity and you may need a little bit more protein. That is an amazing way to get started without having to incorporate any new foods into your diet. You know, okay. like that is like a great way to say, okay, first half of my cycle, I know that I can have more complex carbohydrates. I can have more food that's like fresh foods and then when I'm more plant-based proteins. And then when I'm in the second half of my cycle, I need to focus on getting higher quality lean sources of protein and making sure that I have like, you know, a carb, fat and protein at each meal. So I'm keeping my blood sugar nice and supported and balanced. Like that is an awesome introduction to this. And I think you will feel a huge difference just from that. Yeah. I love that. That's a good baby step to take. I think a lot of us, you know, I've never tracked my period before I've, or my cycle. Um, I feel like that in itself would be the first step for a lot of us. True. Yes. That is the first step. And Just kind of mastering that and then knowing where you're at in your cycle. And then after that, you can, you know, do the things that you just said. And then if you want to get into the seed cycling, you know, I mean, my, my opinion as an IC dietitian is these seeds have such amazing qualities and, and provide your body with such like nutrition just in general. And it might be worth testing them. Um, if you're in a place where you feel confident doing that, and especially if you're someone who is dealing with these hormonal flares, it might be worth it to risk that. Yeah. And I think it's just so individualized and figuring out, you know, if estrogen's high or low or what's going on, but definitely like if anyone has any questions or like needs, maybe like, I know for me, I didn't have the vocabulary when I first started this. I didn't even know like what to ask for. So if you're listening and you're like, okay, this is cool. I'm still highly confused. I still do <laughs> not know what's going on. Like you can always just message me and like, I'm always happy to talk through it and because I think that everyone deserves to feel good and, you know, we deserve to at least ask the questions. Yeah, absolutely. That being said, where can everybody find you? I know you have a podcast, you have social media, you have a website. Let us know. Yeah. So our website's funkitwellness.com. Um, so you can hop over there and look at all of our resources and our products. And then our Instagram and our TikTok are funkitwellness. And then my personal Instagram is carbs and Kate. I used like, I, when I was first like starting to educate people, like the, my biggest vendetta was against low carb diets. I was like, oh, we have to eat a balanced diet. So that's like where that name comes from. Um, but yeah. And then my email is Kate at punkitwellness.com. I'm always happy to talk. And I was in the same shoes as you guys at one point. Like I didn't know any of this. And I didn't understand it. And I didn't feel like I, have been taught about it. So if anyone has questions, I'm always happy to like walk you through everything. 
Awesome. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And, you know, I'll let you know if anybody has questions, we'll link everything in the show notes. And yeah, just really appreciate your time explaining all of this. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, hold on. I just went to stop it and it clicked out.